Hello everyone, Lexi Gavin Mather here, and I've decided to do a course that is kicking it way back to the basics. This is a great course for people that are very new to poker. Maybe you just signed up for the course, or you know, maybe you haven't, you know, you've been playing for a while, but really haven't put too much study into your game. Um, this is also good for people that, you know, are a little bit more experienced in poker. It's never a bad thing to revisit some of the most basic concepts because you're learning and studying so much that it could be, you know, it could be easy to forget some of the more, you know, basic fundamentals. So, um, I decided to create a very basic course and it's going to be kind of a roadmap for you to, you know, help you navigate, um, you know, how your, your study plan and, you know, kind of where to start on your poker journey. All right, let's get into it. How do we even know where to begin? There's, like I said, there's so many concepts in poker. There's so many different strategies and different topics, and it's really hard to know where to begin and like what the first thing you should start with should be. So I think that the very first thing that you need to really familiarize yourself is learn your raise first in ranges. These are your GTO RFI charts. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, let me go ahead and pull some into the screen here. This is an example of a raise first in range. So obviously, actually, first, the very first thing you should probably know is, you know, learn the positions at the table. Um, but once you have that down pat, um, these are your RFI charts. So this is the under the gun range, meaning this these are the hands that you should be raising when you are first to act pre-flop. As you can see, we are pretty tight here, opening most of our, you know, our strongest hands, um, some, you know, ace five suited, ace four suited for balance type things. But basically, this just tells you which hands you should be raising, which hands you should be folding. Uh, let's go down to the button just so that I can show you kind of the biggest contrast here. Um, so the button, we're opening 56% of hands, and you can see that it is just a ton more hands we get to open um, on the button. And you're always going to make, you know, opponent adjustments. If you have tighter players in the blinds, then you can open up a wider range. Uh, or if you have more aggressive players still left to act, then you should probably be playing a little bit tighter. So these are your RFI charts. This is like the holy grail of poker. This is what you need to start with. You, if you have mistakes in your pre-flop game, then you're just setting yourself up for, you know, difficulties and mistakes post-flop. So make sure you have a fundamentally sound pre-flop game and study and memorize these RFI charts. A lot of people have trouble kind of memorizing your RFI charts. And, um, you know, I think a good way to do it is to make flashcards. I think flashcards can be really helpful. And also don't worry about memorizing these to like an exact T, right? Like you should just kind of have an idea, like on the button, you're opening all of your offsuit ace combos and all your suited ace combos and, and four, three suited and up and five, three suited and up, you know, things like that. If you start with the bottom and then just kind of work your way up, like it's easier to kind of remember. Uh, okay. The next thing you should do is familiarize yourself with hand equities by using equity calculators. I like Equilab. Uh, Poker Cruncher is great. Let me go ahead and show you what I mean by that. All right, so basically, uh, this is an equity calculator. It basically tells you what percent chance your hand has of winning against other hands and versus other hand ranges. So let's uh, let me show you what I mean here. So here we have the positions on the left side. Let's say we are on the button. So the BU here, we're gonna click our card selection and let's say we have 10 nine of hearts, okay? So we enter 10 nine of hearts and the small blind shoves all in for 15 big blinds, let's just say. So what we do to figure out our hands equity versus the range that our opponent could be shoving, meaning like the, the number of hands that they could be shoving, uh, what you do is you go to this little like card fanned out icon here and you click that and then you plug in all of the hands that you think your opponent from the small blind is shoving when you open, let's just say you min raise the button and they have 15 big blinds. So you can just like play around with this. Just try to think what hands that they would be shoving with. 
Uh, I think it's going to be like a lot of these Broadway type hands, hands with good removal to some of your snap cards. Removal meaning like when you hold uh, an ace, then it's less likely your opponent has, you know, some ace combos, things like that. Um, so I think they're going to be shoving pretty much any pair in these positions. Um, you know, maybe a range like this. So then what we do, once we've plugged in all of the hands that we think that they're shoving with, um, I think that they're actually going to have some like balance here with the low suited aces and things like that. Um, then we hit apply and then evaluate. And then this tells you whether you can make a profitable call based on the range of hands that the uh, that your opponent is shoving. So you can see that 10 nine of hearts has 38% equity over the 62% equity that the small blind range consists of. So then you know that you, ha you know, that you should probably be folding this spot. Um, I probably could have started you guys off with a more basic way to play around with this. So uh, if that was a little too complicated, um, what you can also do is just start by playing with hands versus other hands, not necessarily hand ranges. So say you are in the cutoff and you have ace king, hit ace king, and then your opponent has pocket tens. You enter that and then you hit evaluate and then you can see that it's, we call this a coin flip. This is like roughly a 50-50 shot. Um, so you can just kind of play around with that and see how your hand matches up to other hands. And this is just a good way for you to understand, you know, kind of the value of hands and, and you know, when you should be making profitable calls and folds. Okay, now let's talk about the, you know, topic that is so, so important, but people just don't want to spend too much time studying and learning, uh, and that's bankroll management. It's so important. So bankroll management is basically just making sure you don't go broke. And as a, you know, I mean, it's obviously more than that, but as a poker player, a lot of poker players, you know, play above their bank rolls and they will, you know, bust their rolls and then they'll, you know, not have any ch any money to play with. So there's a, you know, there's formulas that you can make sure that you are, you know, not letting this happening. Uh, so proper bankroll management is crucial to your success as a poker player. It's very true. The general rule, and this is not a, a set in stone rule, but you should have at least 30 buy-ins of any stake that you play. So if your average buy, if your average stake is one, two, and your average buy-in is a hundred big blinds, so that would be $200. And just, you know, for the cash game players out there, please, please, please always make sure that you're playing with at least 100 big blinds um, when you sit down because the more chips you have, the more playability you have. And the less chips you have, if you have under 100 big blinds, then your session is going to be higher variance, meaning it's going to be more of a gamble and you're not going to, you know, you kind of have to rely a little bit more on luck. Whereas if you have a lot of chips and you have a lot more playability. So I recommend always sitting with at least a hundred big blinds. So in this situation, if you're playing one, two, then your, your average buy-in would be $200, right? So if you need to, you know, in order to proper bankroll, practice proper bankroll management, if you need to have 30 buy-ins of the stake that you're playing, then 30 times 200 is $6,000. So I recommend having at least $6,000 in your bankroll um, to start. Now, if, you know, if it's not like too big of a stake, like one, two, you could get away with less, um, you know, having like 20 big blinds, but the higher the stakes, I recommend just having a bigger bankroll because higher stakes tend to be like more aggressive and tougher. So you want to have, you know, more. Okay. And you want to treat your money as an investment. So understand that when you're sitting at the table, you're, you're investing in yourself, you're investing in your opportunity. And I think that it's really important to, you know, not think of them as chips. It's really easy to just kind of lose a sense of a dollar and, you know, poker chips are just so easy to, you know, just like I said, lose track of what a dollar is, but those chips are real money value. So the, you're sitting down with a bunch of chips. These are an investment into yourself and you need to take it seriously. 
Um, I also think you should be investing yourself in other ways like buying poker coaching courses and classes and private coaching. Um, hiring a private coach is a great idea. The more money you spend on yourself learning, the you know obviously the better you're going to do at the tables and you'll have a higher ROI or return on investment when you do invest in yourself. And then you always want to separate poker money from life money. So I always suggest having two different bank accounts, one for your life expense expenses and then one for your poker bankroll. The reason for this is because it's it could be really um, taxing on you to have all of your money mixed and it could it could affect your emotions if you find that you're gambling with your rent money or you know if you have a bad session and you see that you know if if you're not separating the two then you're just going to have a hard time compartmentalizing and poker you know no matter how you slice it you are going to lose sometimes so you need to make sure that you separate your two bank accounts and you know try not to attach any emotion to your poker bankroll uh, bank account because it's going to fluctuate. But when you see your rent money fluctuating, then that could be really stressful and then that'll force you to make bad plays on the table. I actually recommend having uh, set aside life expenses for at least one year before you decide to go pro if that's something you're considering. Um, make sure you have enough money to set yourself up for a year that you can, you know, kind of financially support the downswings. Okay, so now let's talk about shot taking. And what I mean by shot taking is, you know, say you've been playing 1-2 for a while and you've been consistently winning. I think it's okay, even if you're not quite bankrolled for it, but you can take a shot at a higher stake as long as you're doing it responsibly. So First and most important, I think confidence is so important. You have to be confident in your game and you can't jump up to a stake that makes you nervous. I remember the first time I ever took a shot at 510. I was like regularly grinding 25 and it was going really great and I was winning consistently over time. Um, but I remember that the players of the 510 game were like really, really good. This was way back in the day, like 15 years ago. And I remember just feeling inadequate in a way. I Like the 510 players kind of felt like the cool kids and I wasn't quite sure I was ready to fit into that yet. So I uh, jumped up to the 510 level. I played for like an hour and then I lost all my chips. Um, so if you're not confident, it's going to show in your game and don't try not to take a shot at a higher stake if you don't feel like you're ready. Um, so... You can take a five buy-in shot when you've built up your confidence and your bankroll a bit. It's good to get some experience at the higher level. If you lose, then just move back down. Uh, it shouldn't take you long before you can take another shot and there is no rush to do so until you feel absolutely ready. It could be like really hard and ego, I think I always say ego is the silent killer of poker players. Ego could destroy your poker game if you... If you move up in stakes or if you're just like regularly playing, you know, like 2-5 and you're going on a downswing and your bankroll is suffering, then you have to have the discipline to move down in stakes. And that could be really, really hard for someone to do, especially if you're a regular at a casino and they see you playing in, you know, the 2-5 game and then you feel like you're almost embarrassed to have to move down in stakes. Well, you shouldn't because it happens to everybody. And, you know, having that discipline to move down in stakes is really going to, you know, separate you from, you know, the, the ego players, you know, to the, to the players that are just playing, you know, more responsibly. And I t I'm telling you, over the long term, like, you will, you will be rewarded for that. And then if you're a tournament player, I always say with tournaments, stick to, try to stick to an average buy-in strategy and then make adjustments based on how soft you expect the field to be. So for instance, say you're properly bankrolled for $400 tournaments and those have been going really well and that's kind of your average buy-in. Like it's okay to take a shot, you know, at a higher, higher tournament or, you know, it's okay obviously to drop down, but 
if you you can take more shots if you expect the field to be softer in higher buy-ins. So for instance, if there's like a 1K that's running with a $2 million guarantee or something absurd like that, and they're running a lot of satellites for it, so you know that there's going to be a lot of recreational players in it, then you can, you know, you can take a shot at that higher buy-in if you expect the field to be softer. Because when you have an edge in the field, that's, you know, that's really going to help you you know, cash more and, and hopefully maybe win the tournament. And a couple more things to note. If things are going well, it might be tempting to take a shot in a bigger game. Try to resist that temptation if your bankroll strategy doesn't allow for it. Playing at a high level without the funds to back you up is a recipe for disaster. And you should never play with scared money. It's very easy to naturally address your strategy when you see your money, money dwindling down. Um, you know, move move up in stakes when you hit a rough patch. Or I'm sorry, move down in stakes when you hit a rough patch. Just try to be honest with yourself. It's very easy to lie to yourself in poker. So, you know, make sure that you're always being straight up and honest with yourself. Poker is a marathon, not a sprint. This is so, so true. Poker is all about getting to the long term as fast as you can. And it's really hard to do that I'll explain what I mean in a second. It's really hard to do that playing one table. So there's variance in poker, meaning you are going to, you know, get it in good and lose for hundreds of hands. It's just like how poker works. So what I mean by get to the long term as fast as you can, when you're playing in a casino, you're sitting at a table, you're playing one hand, right? You're, or I'm sorry, you're seeing, you're playing one table. So you're seeing, you know, maybe 30 hands an hour, but when you're playing online, you can you have the luxury to play multiple tables. So what I used to do is I used to play 24 to 30 tables online at a time. And I, so I was seeing thousands of hands an hour. So I was able to get to the long term faster because I was putting in so much volume. The more hands and the more volume you play, the more variance balances out. So you'll, you'll get to equilibrium faster if you play more tables. Now, I'm not suggesting you should go and play and fire up 30 tables at a time. That's definitely not something I would suggest, especially if you're new to poker. But, um, you know, try if you have access to playing online, try throwing in two tables. And then when you feel more confident and you feel like you have that under control, then add in a third table and then a fourth table and see if you can really... Make sure that you're focusing on every table and every decision. And if it gets too much, then I would say just, you know, cut cut down a table. Um, but the more hands you play and the more volume you play, the more variance kind of measures out. Now, I'm not saying you can't win in, li- in live poker. That's not at all what I'm saying. The games generally are softer in live poker. Um, you know, just try to play a fundamentally sound game in your, you know, a, a stake that you're comfortable with and you're going to crush <laughs> as long as you study. Studying is very important. Okay, so now that we've talked about kind of the, you know, fundamental stuff, where to begin, the mindset type stuff, let's talk about pre-flop bet sizing because there are bet sizing formulas that you have to make sure you're sticking to. Um, otherwise, you are just not going to, you're just playing improperly. So, your, your bet sizing is going to depend and change based on your stack depth. So when you're under 20 big blinds effective or 20 big blinds and under, you can min raise, meaning you can double the size of the big blind and you can open shove less. So if you have like 15 big blinds, uh, you can still min raise fold off that stack size, but you can um, also have like an open shoving strategy, meaning you can just go all in preflop when you're under 20 big blinds. Uh, 21 to 49 big blinds effective, I would say 2.25x the big blind. It really kind of depends on whether you're playing a tournament or a cash game. Um, Tournaments, I tend to choose smaller preflop bet sizing because tournaments are all about stack preservation and every chip that you do invest in the pot um, is, you know, every chip is so valuable. Whereas in a cash game, you have the luxury to reload. Um, And like I said earlier, I'm never playing in a cash game when I'm under 100 big blinds. This is more like the effective stack, meaning the smallest stack in play. 
So when you're 21 to 49 big blinds effective, you should 2.25x the big blind. When you're 50 to 100 big blinds, you can 2.5x, you can even 3x. This, these sizings are not set in stone. This is just kind of a general idea. 100 big blinds uh, effective, you can 3x the big blind. Uh, 200 big blinds and in cash games, 4x, you can even 5x the big blind. The idea, and I think you're getting it, is the deeper you are, the, more, the bigger your preflop bet sizes should be. And then if there's limpers, so when somebody just calls the size of the big blind, you want to add one big blind for every limper and then one big blind if you're out of position, like playing from the blinds or something. So for instance, if uh, you if the blinds are $1, $2, and somebody limps in for $2 and you're on the button and you want to raise, then I would go three times the two, which is $6, right? Three times the, the big blind, plus an additional big blind for that limper. So three times two is six, plus that $2 for that limper is eight. So I would raise to $8. If I was in the small blind and I wanted to raise, in that same situation, I would raise to $10 because I always add one extra big blind for being out of position. So now let's talk about three betting and we're going to get more into three betting later in this presentation, but three betting is basically a re-raise. So when you want to re-raise somebody, so say somebody opens to, you know, $6 and you want to re-raise that person, uh, you would go $18. So three bet sizing, uh, you multiply on the opening raise size and you add one times the bet, one bet for every caller. So let's say you're 100 big blinds effective at 100, 200, there's a raise to 600 and a call. Your three bet or your re-raise re size would be uh, three, 3x to 18, so 1800 plus that 600 for that uh, other caller. So it would be 2400 total, right? So three times the 18 plus 600 for the flatter so that's 2400 you would raise to. I know this, again, I know this is super basic, but it's really important that you guys stick to these um, sizing formulas because you never want to give your opponents too good of a price to call. And I see this so much with my new students or recreational players. They're just choosing raise sizes uh, and three bet sizes pre-flop where you're just giving your opponents an auto call. And you never want to do that, right? Like, the the more players in the hand, the less your the lower your hand's equity becomes and the less likely it is you're gonna win that pot, right? It's just a fact. Like even pocket aces hand, you know, that your hand with pocket aces, that your equity goes down significantly if there's five players in the pot. And you need to make sure that you're choosing proper three bet sizes to to really squeeze them out of the pot. Um, you know, you always want to try to isolate to a heads up pot or a three way pot. So your chances of winning post flop are greater, right? If you're up against five or six ranges pre flop, like chances are you're, you're not going to take down the pot. All right. Learn how to count outs and equity. This is actually, this sounds intimidating, but it's so not. So there's the rule of four and two. So when you're, first of all, Equity is just like the percent chance that your hand has of winning. So like when we were just doing the equity calculators before, um, pocket tens to ace king is roughly 50-50. It's like 52%, 48%, some, you know, something along those lines. So um, that's your equity. So pocket tens has roughly 52% equity to win the hand. So what you do on the flop, so say you have a hand and you're on the flop, you're going to count the number of outs and multiply that by four. So the number of outs that you need to complete your draw and you multiply that by four. And that's how much equity you have to complete your draw. So what I mean by that, let's, let's look at an example or let me tell you an example. So say you have a flush draw, right? Say you have two spades and there's two spades on the flop and you want to know the percent chance that your hand has of winning, right? So what you do is you count how many outs you need, right? How many outs you have. So you have 
two spades in your hand. There's two spades on the board. There's 13 cards of every suit. So you have nine spades to come that will complete your flush draw, right? That will give you the flush. So all you do is you take those nine outs and you multiply that by four. And that gives you 36% equity. So you have a 36% chance of completing your flush on the flop. When you're on the turn, so say you counted your outs and your equity and you missed the, the, the turn. You did not complete the flush by the turn. And now you're on the turn. So all you do is you just, because instead of two cards to come, there's only one card to come. So instead of multiplying your outs by, not, by four, you multiply your outs by two. So you still have nine spades in the deck that could come, but you only have one card to come. So nine times two is 18. You have an 18% chance of hitting your flush by the river. So you have 18% equity. All right. So when you have a straight draw, let's, let's look at a straight draw. So with a straight draw, say you have five, six on the, on the seven, eight deuce flop, right? So you have eight outs, right? You have four, uh, fours and you have four nines, right? You have five, six, you can make a straight if the four comes, or you can make a straight if the nine comes, right? Five, six, the board is seven, eight nines or fours will give you a straight. So that's eight outs. So on the flop, you have eight times four is 32% equity. On the turn, eight times two is 16% equity if you missed your straight on the turn. All right. So I hope you guys understand that. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about position. Um, you know, we talked earlier with the raise first in ranges, uh, understanding, you know, what hands you should be opening. You're always going to be tighter in early position and wider in later position. Um, when you're in early position, you're out of position on everybody. So you have a positional disadvantage. Anyone that acts after you has more information on you. So therefore you're at a disadvantage post swap. So the idea is you want to try to play as much in position and as little out of position as you can. So that's why we stay super tight in early position and we widen up quite a bit as we get closer to the button and the button we we can play the most hands because on the button we are guaranteed to be in position on everybody at the table post flop. So therefore we can play a wider range of hands and because we have more information on everybody else. Um, position, you know, it's, it becomes more important as stacks become deeper. So when you're short stack in early position, um, you don't have as many options. You have to play, you know, more of a, if you're like 10 big blinds or 15 big blinds, you're going to play more of a shove or fold type of strategy. Um, so it doesn't, when you're, when you're deeper, you're gonna, it, it's just, more important to play a more f- like a more like pot controlled type of strategy when you're super super deep. So f- what I mean is like say you're 200 big blinds deep and you flop a draw. Um, you don't necessarily say you flop like a, a flush draw with nine eight of hearts or something, and there's two hearts on the board. You don't necessarily want to play a 400 big blind pot with you know with a a nine high flush draw. So you're going to be doing a little bit more like pot controlling when the stacks are deeper and you want to play tighter in early position because you don't want to like have to play big pots in out of position post flop. So try to, but on the other hand, when you are deeper, like you can play a wider range of hands. You just have to, you know, proceed with more caution post flop, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, And as you get closer to the button, obviously with the short stack, you can shove wider than if you were in early position. So just always try to make those positional adjustments based on your stack size. And always be aware of ranges. So what I mean by range, you know, we talked about it earlier is understanding what, you know, what the range of cards your opponent can have based on the position and the stack size and, uh, you know, a few other factors. So for example, say you're, you know, you open in under the gun position, say you have pocket aces and you raise it up. 
and it folds around to the big blind and the big blind calls. And the flop is nine, eight, seven with, you know, two hearts and you have eight of spades, eight of, ace of spades, eight of clubs. You have to be aware that that is a really good board for the big blinds range because the big blind is going to have more two pairs than you on that board because they're flatting with, you know, hands like nine, seven suited, nine, eight suited, eight, seven suited, things like that. And the big blind can always have more flush draws than you because you, they are, you know, they already have a big blind invested. So they are getting a better price to call. Um, so they're going to be flatting wider with, you know, suited hands that we wouldn't be opening in early position. So they're going to be calling with hands like king three of spades where we're never going to be, you know, opening that in early position. So uh, they can always have more flush draws than you. Um, so always be aware of ranges. And yeah, let's now move on to pot odds. It's always important to understand pot odds. And, you know, you don't have to be a math wizard in poker. Poker math is pretty easy, but you definitely have to have a general idea of, you know, pot odds and equities and stuff like that. So <clears throat> pot odds are considered the price in poker. It's the ratio between the size of the pot and the size of the bet. So let's look at an example. So again, pot odds equals the size of the pot to the size of the bet. Say the pot size is $100 and the bet size is $50. So now the total pot size is $150. So you ha are getting $150 to, uh, you, you're getting $150 to 50. Uh, so you're getting three to one because what you do is you divide both sides by 50. So you are getting three to one pot odds. So you're risking $50 to win $200 because you always have to consider the, you know, if you invest $50, that money is now into the pot. So you're risking $50 to win $200. So you're getting three to one odds, risking 50 to win 200. This is something that's super important to memorize. This is gonna tell you what percent equity your hand needs uh, to make a profitable call based on the pot odds. So when you're getting four to one odds, you need 20% equity. So if you have a flush draw, you know on the, on the flop, then you know that you have 36% equity. So if you're getting four to one odds, you know that you can make a profitable call because your hand only requires 20% equity. If you're on the turn and you have a, the flush draw, then you know that your hand has roughly 18% equity. Because it's so close, I would more than likely not fold my hand when I'm getting four to one odds. Um, so just try to memorize this because this is really helpful and it's an easy way to kind of memorize like, you know, when you're getting what hand, what percent equity your hand needs, uh, based on the pot odds. All right. So hand class. So what your hand class is, you're, whenever you have a hand and you're dealt a flop, I always want you to break your hands up into four different classes. This is a very, very basic strategy. And as you get more advanced, you're obviously going to be making adjustments to this. But this is kind of how I want you to think of um, your hands in terms of classes. So your class A are your value hands. These are all of your top pair, top kickers, your two pair sets, straights, flushes, full houses, right? All of the hands that you want to bet for value. Your class B are your draws. So these can be any kind of draws, your flush draws, straight draws, backdoor flush draws, gut shots, things like that. Your class C are your medium strength hands. These can be anything from middle and bottom pairs, sometimes some good ace highs. And then your class D are your garbage hands. These are hands that completely miss. This would be like ace four of hearts on a nine, eight, seven, all spades type of board. So then what we want to do is we want to group our class A and our class B hands together. And for the most part, we're going to be continuation betting these. So <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, continuation betting is when you were the pre-flop aggressor. You were the last person to make the aggressive action pre-flop. And continuation betting would just be to continue betting on the flop. So... What you're going to do, you're going to group your at, your class A and your class B, so your value hands and your draws, and you're going to be betting those. And then you're going to group your class C and your class D hands, so your middling hands and your garbage hands. And for the most part, we're going to be checking those. 
The reason we do this is to remain balanced. We don't always want to just bet every time we have a pair. So we don't want to just bet when we have, you know, a class A and a class C hand and then check when we have like a class B and a class D, right? We always want to just try to be balanced so that we have, you know, we can keep our opponents on their toes and they never really know what we're up to. So now that we know when, you know, what hands we should be C betting and what hands we should be checking for the most part, the C bet size and frequency, so the bet sizing that we choose and how often we choose to do it, varies based on the board texture. So we're going to C bet more on dry boards and choose a small sizing. And then we're going to C bet less on wet textures and choose a larger sizing. So just for those of you who don't know, a dry board is a board that is not connected there's not really any draws so an example of a dry board would be like king seven two rainbow and a wet board has a lot of draws and a lot of connectivity so that would be like a jack ten nine with a flush draw type of board that would be a wet wet board um bed sizing is a function of frequency the more often we do something the oops, the more often we do something the smaller we should go. And the less often we should do, we do something, the bigger we should go. So because we don't, you know, we bet small boards at a higher frequency, we're gonna choose a smaller sizing. And because we bet less often on wet boards, we're gonna choose a bigger sizing. I hope you guys enjoyed this course. If you liked it, you know, go ahead and give me a follow on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, all that. I'm Lexi Gavin Poker. Um, I love to hear from you guys over there. So give me a shout out and, uh, all right guys, have a great day. Good luck in your games and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.